Hello from the Women's Rights National Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York. We're sorry that you might not be able to join us physically, but we're thrilled to be able to bring some of our history to you through video. As you may know, 2020 is the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which declared that the right to vote shall not be abridged or denied on the basis of sex. So women can't be stopped from voting in elections just because they are women. A lot of folks don't know that the fight for women's right to vote began long before 1920. Many historians consider the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 to be the official start of the women's suffrage movement. Our park commemorates that convention and the women who planned it. The historic homes of women's rights leaders Mary Ann McClintock, Jane Hunt, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as well as the chapel where the 1848 convention was held, are all part of our park. So, what did it mean to be a woman in the 1840s? Every culture is a little bit different, and our park is mostly focused on what it was like to be a woman in the United States, in sort of mainstream society. But remember, there have always been smaller groups within the United States that act differently. For example, before Europeans colonized New York, this area was the home of the Haudenosaunee. You might have also heard them called the Iroquois. This was, and still is, a group of nations including the Seneca and Cayuga peoples, who lived closest to where the park is now, as well as the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, and the Tuscarora. These peoples didn't have the same expectations of women that European settlers did. Haudenosaunee women were involved in major community decisions, were responsible not just for cooking but for planting and growing crops, and wore different styles of clothing than European American women did, for example. But. What was life like for the majority of American women? Well, what would you like to do when you get older? Do you want to become a doctor, an architect, a lawyer, an engineer? Do you want to go to college, travel the world, make lots of money? Do you like being able to wear pants? For most women in the 1840s in America, none of these were an option. Very few colleges accepted women. There were a handful of schools set up specifically for women, like the Willard School in Troy, New York, where Elizabeth Cady Stanton studied, but they didn't teach the same things that men's schools did. Men were generally taught things like Greek, Latin, and the law, while women were taught things like French and dancing. Since women couldn't go to school to study things like medicine or law, it was hard for them to do those jobs, but that didn't cause too many problems back then because, generally, women weren't expected to work outside the home. Their jobs were to be wives and mothers, and to run the household. That was no small job. They had to do laundry, all by hand, to cook, preserve food by making jams, canning, pickling, etc., clean the house, and take care of the children, just for starters. If they had the money to hire people, or especially in the South, buy people, to do the work for them, they still had to oversee everything happening in the house, and then they would also be expected to show off their wealth by spending their time sewing, or hosting visitors, or improving the household in other ways. Women were responsible for raising sons into men who would contribute to society, and girls into women who would be good wives and mothers. It definitely wasn't easy to do all of the things people thought a good wife and mother should. Martha Wright, one of the leaders of the women's suffrage movement, supported women's rights, and she thought being a wife and mother was the most noble thing a woman could do. She just wanted people to stop talking about those things as though they weren't important jobs. A lot of women and girls today want to be wives and mothers. There's nothing wrong with that. But not everyone wants those things, and that's the problem with the expectation that every woman should do the same thing. And in the 1840s, once women married, they lost all control of their property. Anything they owned belonged to their husbands. Any money they earned also belonged to their husbands. There were plenty of men who respected their wives and children, but if they didn't want to, women didn't have many ways to protect themselves. A woman's husband could sell her clothes, spend her money, and even take her children away from her, and as far as the law was concerned, there wasn't anything she could do about it. Divorce was uncommon, and there were only a few ways that it would be granted. But if a woman did get a divorce, her husband kept all the property and the children. Since most women weren't trained for a profession, that meant that after a divorce, they were usually left with few options besides going back to their parents' home. Throughout the 1800s, some states passed new laws about married women's property. Most of them said that women could own property but not control it. Someone else would have to make the decisions of what to do with it. But the property couldn't be sold without the woman's permission. And because the property was in the woman's name, if her husband had any debts that needed to be paid, her property couldn't be taken away to pay them. This certainly wasn't a bad thing for married women, but it mostly helped only wealthier women. 
Families with property like land and houses to pass down to their daughters could now be confident that their sons-in-law couldn't sell off the family farm, even if they owed a lot of money. On the other hand, any money that women earned while they were married was still considered their husband's property. So poorer women who didn't have much property really didn't benefit from these laws. There were exceptions to some of these expectations as well. Women from wealthy families might get more education if they wanted it, and their fathers thought it was worthwhile. They might get to travel, too, but no matter how old they were, they would have to travel with a chaperone. A lot of hotels or inns might not allow women traveling alone to stay there, and some restaurants might even refuse to serve them. People thought that a woman traveling alone was probably immoral, or at least not respectable. Poor women might, on, might not only have the option of working outside the home, they might have to in order to take care of the family. That might mean they had to find someone to take care of their very young children, whether that meant an older child or another family member or a neighbor. Once those kids were old enough to start making money for the family, in some cases as young as five or seven years old, they might have to get jobs too. They might be working on the family farm or making things at home to sell, but more and more families started working in mills and factories. In the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution really took off. Instead of most things being produced in smaller shops, big factories started to take over a lot of industries. Instead of taking years and years to learn how to make things, machines would do most of the work, and it didn't take nearly as long to learn how to run the machines. Not only men, but also women and children started getting jobs in factories, but women didn't get paid as much as men even doing the same job, and only men were ever hired to supervise. This was true even outside of factories. When Susan B. Anthony worked as a teacher, she made about a quarter of what men did doing the same job at the same school. Another leader of the women's rights movement, Lucy Stone, made eight cents an hour teaching, while her male colleagues made twelve and a half cents an hour. On top of all this, remember, any money women might earn while they were married was still controlled by their husbands. So even if a woman tried to bring in some extra money to buy food or clothes for the family, her husband could spend that on whatever he wanted. If a woman's husband died, she was legally to inherit at least a third of his property. And as a widow, she could actually own it. But with the rise of the Industrial Revolution, when more and more people started working in factories instead of owning their own tools and businesses, widows became less likely to inherit the tools to keep making money. Widows, like some married women, might choose to start renting out rooms in their home if they owned the house, or they might have to move in with other family while they kept working at factories. So, if you were a woman in the 1840s, your profession, your education, your property were all out of your control. Not just because of what people expected, but because of what the law said. And you weren't allowed to vote, so you didn't get a voice in changing those laws. It wasn't even acceptable for women to wear pants until the last few years of the 1800s, and even then only for certain activities like riding a bicycle. In the 1840s, they were expected to wear corsets and long skirts. Have you ever seen a movie where a woman wore a corset so tight she couldn't breathe and passed out? Corsets weren't supposed to be that tight. They were supposed to support and shape a woman's middle. Wearing one should not stop her from breathing, but it would probably stop her from slouching and smooth out her waist under her dress. It might even give her back support while working. But some women didn't like wearing them. They were constrictive, after all. And have you ever worn a long dress and tripped over it? Women did that too, especially when they were cleaning the house or carrying things up and down stairs. Imagine wearing a dress with many layers that goes to your feet, carrying a baby and a candle to light your way, and then trying to climb a set of stairs. How do you think that's going to go? Well, that's why bloomers became so popular for some women, at least for a while. Instead of long skirts and corsets, the bloomer costume had a looser waist, a skirt that stopped at the knees, and loose pants under that skirt. But have you ever worn something to school or with your friends, maybe because it was comfortable or you liked the way it looked and been made fun of for it? Did you feel comfortable wearing that again, or were you too embarrassed? I've definitely been there and definitely did not feel comfortable wearing those clothes again. Well, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who we'll talk more about soon, had similar problems when she tried wearing bloomers for a while. Her husband didn't have a problem with it, and some of her friends dressed that way too, but her sons asked her not to visit them at school dressed that way. Her sister cried when she heard how Elizabeth was dressing in public. When Elizabeth's husband ran for office, some people refused to vote for him because of the way she dressed. When Martha Wright visited a friend, her friend's daughters refused to be seen in public with Martha dressed that way, 
Susan B. Anthony, another leader of the women's suffrage movement, said they started wearing the bloomers to free their bodies, but they became a mental prison. There were a lot of people who thought the bloomer costume was scandalous. Some people said women who wore pants were immodest, even though the pants were very loose by modern standards. Other people thought that women wearing pants would mean that their husbands would have to start wearing skirts and staying home to take care of the children. In later years, one magazine said that if women started wearing pants, they would start driving cabs, becoming police officers, drinking beer, and smoking cigars. All things that women were not supposed to do. It might be hard to imagine the kind of reaction these women experienced because today we're usually a lot more accepting of people dressing however makes them happy, but like today, clothing was a strong part of identity in the 1800s, and back then people expected the differences between men and women to be significant. After only a few years, pretty much everyone had stopped wearing bloomers. Women like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Martha Wright, and others we'll be talking about were trying to lead a movement for women's rights, and they wanted people to focus on what they were saying, not what they were wearing. Suffrage sounds like a bad thing, but it just means the right to vote. The people who worked to expand suffrage were called suffragists, or suffragettes. You probably heard the term suffragette before, and it's usually what people call the women who fought for the right to vote. But you might not know that it was originally intended to be insulting. In England, a newspaper used it to make fun of women who had started to use militant tactics to protest, like breaking store windows, starting fires, and generally causing a scene in public. Those women chose to take the name as a badge of honor. It was mostly used in England, but today people often refer to women in the United States this way too. At our park, we use the word suffragist when we talk about someone in America who supported the right to vote, because that's what most activists in America called themselves. They didn't want to be associated with the tactics in Britain, and they were worried that destroying property would turn people away from their cause. But by the last years before the 19th Amendment was ratified, they did start using some of the British approaches. The movement to allow women to vote grew partly out of the movement to abolish or end slavery. A lot of the same people supported both ideas, or came to support both. Some people argued for women being able to vote because they could help to vote end slavery. Members of the Society of Friends, also called Quakers, usually chose not to vote for religious reasons, but they were heavily involved in both abolition and suffrage. Friends believe that everyone has a little bit of God in them, and in their church meetings, anybody can stand up and speak if they feel the Spirit move them. Friends also believe that marriage is a partnership of equals, and when women got married, instead of leaving their birth families to join their husband's family, they usually kept closer ties to their siblings and parents and cousins than many women in the 19th century might. That meant that Quaker women had their own social networks outside of the household, which gave them more protection and support. Because their religion says that all people are equal, it made sense that a lot of Quakers were, and are, involved in social movements to get equal rights for black Americans, women, Native Americans, and others. Groups started organizing as early as the 1700s to push for the end of slavery, and the abolition movement expanded a lot in the early 1800s. They held meetings, published declarations against slavery, and sent petitions to Congress. In 1840, the World Anti-Slavery Convention was held in London, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton was there with her new husband, Henry Stanton. The problem was, the leaders of the convention didn't believe that women should be speaking in public, so even the women who had been sent to represent anti-slavery organizations were told to sit separately from the men and not to speak. In fact, people at that convention ended up talking more about whether women could join in public discussion than they did about abolishing slavery. Lucretia Mott, a Quaker minister who had helped to form the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, one of the first women's political organizations in the United States, was one of those women forced to be quiet. Lucretia and Elizabeth were insulted and angry to have been excluded from the discussions in London, and the two of them decided that there should be a convention specifically about women's rights. When they got home to the United States, the convention didn't happen right away, but the idea stuck with them. In 1847, Elizabeth moved with her husband and sons from Boston to Seneca Falls. Her father owned the house, and rather than giving it to her husband, Henry, he gave control of the house to Elizabeth herself. She was excited at first to focus on her household, renovating the house and taking care of her kids, but after a while she got pretty tired of all the cleaning and cooking. She wanted to do other things, and she missed the busy city life. Seneca Falls was a much smaller town than Boston, and there was less hustle and bustle and fewer people for her to visit. 
She was bored, lonely, and frustrated that as a woman, she was kept from doing more. Her husband got to travel and visit other people and places while she was expected to stay home and take care of the house and children. When Elizabeth was little, her father was a judge. A lot of women would come to him to ask for help, and Elizabeth saw how women often suffered in ways men didn't. When one woman's husband died, the house went to her son, and her son kicked her out of her own home. But there was nothing that Judge Katie could do. Now that Elizabeth was older and living in Seneca Falls, her house was close to a neighborhood of poor Irish immigrants, and she saw many of these women experiencing the same problems she saw when she was little. Their husbands could spend all the family's money however they wanted. And that might mean that those women and their children didn't have enough to eat. There was also no law that said a husband couldn't hurt his wife or children. That was just another private family matter. Elizabeth was only getting angrier. In July of 1848, Elizabeth was invited to spend the afternoon with some friends at Jane Hunt's house. Jane's husband, Richard, was just about the wealthiest man in town, and their house was large and grand. She had also just had another baby, so it was harder for her to visit friends than for them to come to her. Jane and Richard were Quakers and opposed slavery. Historians think their house was a stop on the Underground Railroad, which helped countless people escape slavery. Jane had also worked within her church for more equality between men's and women's meetings. Jane had invited her friend, Marianne McClintock, from down the street. Marianne was a Quaker minister and an abolitionist. She and her husband refused to sell any goods in their store which had been produced using slave labor. She had also played a role in founding anti-slavery societies in both Philadelphia and New York. Also attending tea at the Hunt home that July afternoon was Martha Wright. She lived in nearby Auburn, but her family was from Nantucket, Massachusetts. Nantucket was a town that depended on fishing and shipping as its major industries. A lot of men were gone for months at a time, and the women left behind stepped up to run the households and control the property. After Martha's father died, she watched her mother run her own businesses for years to pay off her father's debts. Martha's older sister, Lucretia Mott, who we mentioned earlier at the convention in London, helped to raise her little sister, and the two of them were very close. Lucretia was in town to visit Martha, so the two of them went together to Jane's home. By the time Elizabeth Cady Stanton joined the other ladies at Jane Hunt's house, she had a lot of things to say about women and the rights they deserved. The other ladies agreed, and rather than just talking amongst themselves, they decided to do something about it. They would hold a convention to talk publicly about women's rights. It was considered improper for women to speak in public, though, so the only one of the five who had public speaking experience was Lucretia. She was also pretty famous for speaking about abolition, so the women wanted to make sure that Lucretia could be there. Her fame would bring people to the convention, and her experience would help it be a success. Lucretia was going home to Philadelphia soon, so they didn't have much time. They quickly drew up a notice to put in the newspaper. There would be a meeting to discuss women's rights on July 19th and 20th at the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel in Seneca Falls. That meant that the ladies only had about eight days to plan their event. There was a good reason they chose the Wesleyan Chapel as the site for their convention. About five years before, the Methodist Church had fractured over the issue of slavery. Some members and most of the church leadership didn't want to alienate southern slaveholders by coming out against slavery. But other members strongly opposed slavery and believed that it was a sin. How could a church support something which was sinful? A group of people in Seneca Falls decided they would break away from the Methodist Church and form a Wesleyan Methodist congregation. The chapel in Seneca Falls was built with donations, including a few hundred dollars from Richard Hunt, Jane's husband. He wasn't a member, but he supported their cause because he opposed slavery too. The chapel was open to anyone who wanted to speak about social issues, and they wouldn't turn away the women even if they did have a somewhat new idea. The women also had a couple of things in their favor. Most of them being Quakers, they could spread the word not only among their families, but also throughout their congregations, so plenty of folks would hear about it. Plus. Quakers were commonly involved in social movements like abolitionism, so they had practice planning conventions and sending petitions. These skills would come in handy in asking for women's rights, too. They invited Frederick Douglass to come to the convention, and he published a notice for the convention in his newspaper, The North Star. A self-emancipated man, he was only 30 years old, but already famous for his work against slavery, and the only person of color we know for sure was at this first convention. A few days before the convention, Elizabeth visited Mary Ann McClintock at her home, and the two of them, as well as Mary Ann's oldest daughters, Elizabeth and Mary Ann, 
tried to draft a declaration for the convention. They didn't just want to come up with a list of things to talk about. They wanted the convention to be able to put out a message at the end. They looked through all sorts of documents trying to figure out how they wanted to write their declaration, but nothing seemed to make it sound important enough. Eventually, they decided to use the Declaration of Independence as a model, replacing King George with men, and they called it the Declaration of Sentiments. The most well-known part of this document is another big change from the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Sentiments declares that all men and women are created equal. The ladies expected there to be some people at their convention, but they didn't expect the roughly 300 people who showed up. When they arrived at the chapel the morning of the convention, they discovered the minister had forgotten to unlock the door. The ladies had 300 people waiting to get inside, so Elizabeth boosted her young nephew through an open window, and he had to run over and unlock the door so everyone could get in. The first day was supposed to be only for women. They didn't want women to be afraid to speak up, and they didn't want men to take over the discussion. When men showed up on the first day, it was decided that they could stay, but not speak. Have you ever really cared about something and gotten support from someone who you might not have expected? How did that make you feel? Maybe like you were justified or like you weren't asking for something silly? For some women like Charlotte Woodward, a 19-year-old glove maker, the fact that there were men there to support women's rights made them feel brave enough to come back for the second day of the convention too. The ladies read their declaration to the convention and each piece of it was discussed and voted on. Most of it was passed unanimously. The part that a lot of people disagreed about was the part where Elizabeth said women should be able to vote. Even Lucretia was startled by the suggestion. She said Elizabeth would make them look ridiculous. Nobody would accept that women could or should vote. That was too much to ask right now. Frederick Douglass spoke strongly in support of women's right to vote, but Elizabeth said when Frederick sat down, there was still more she wanted to say. She might not have been planning to speak in front of a mixed audience, that is, men as well as women, but she did. And between the two of them, the suffrage clause was approved, although only by a few votes. Ever since the United States was founded, we've been debating whether voting is a right or a privilege. Does the government get to decide who votes, or is everyone born with the right to choose their representatives in government? This had an impact on the way that people talked about expanding who was allowed to vote. If voting was a privilege, then what requirements should people fulfill before they got that privilege? Under the British Empire, most colonies required that a man own property, either land or just a certain amount of money, in order to vote. In a few cases, women managed to vote if they owned property, if their husband had died. Some colonies, though, didn't allow Catholic or Jewish men to vote. But if voting was a right, how could we not allow black people, women, or even children to vote? As normal as some of these sound today, they were shocking and impossible ideas for most of the men who helped frame America's government. Once the Civil War began in 1861, the women's suffrage movement was mostly set aside. Women hoped that by focusing on supporting the country through war, their contributions would be recognized afterward. After that war, though, more people wanted to focus on getting equal rights for black men. The 13th Amendment passed during the war had ended slavery, but it wasn't until three years later that the 14th Amendment made them citizens. This was also the first time the word male had been used in the Constitution. Up until that point, the founding document of the country only used the word person, which meant that women could argue that they were included too. Although most supporters of the women's rights movement didn't oppose making black people citizens, a lot of them did oppose introducing the word male, and for that reason, they opposed the 14th Amendment. In 1870, the 15th Amendment, granting black men the right to vote, was finally ratified. Once again, leaders of the women's suffrage movement largely didn't oppose black men voting, but they wanted women to be included. Because neither side believed that universal suffrage, allowing everyone to vote at the same time, was going to happen, the fight for women's suffrage changed. The suffragists split into two groups. One faction centered in Boston wanted to make sure that black men were able to vote, and then they would worry about getting women the vote. Frederick Douglass was on this side. Speaking as a black man, he said, When women, because they are women, are objects of insult and outrage at every turn, when they are in danger of having their homes burnt down over their heads, when their children are not allowed to enter schools, then they will have an urgency to obtain the ballot equal to our own. The other faction, centered in New York City, wanted black men and women to be able to vote, but if they had to choose between one or the other, they wanted women to be able to vote first. They advocated for educated suffrage, 
They didn't want uneducated black men to be able to vote, while educated white women still couldn't. They argued that the thing that made people able to vote responsibly was their education, not their gender. Don't forget that being smart and being educated aren't the same thing. Enslaved people by the time of the Civil War couldn't legally be taught to read and write in many states, and it was assumed that they were stupid. We know that wasn't true. A lot of people kept in slavery were incredibly smart, and even if they weren't, that doesn't mean they shouldn't get to vote. I wish we had more time today to talk about all the ways that black men were prevented from voting, even once they were legally able to. People used intimidation, threats, violence, and even murder to keep them away from the polls. But unfortunately, we just don't have time. Suffice it to say that just because the 15th Amendment was ratified and part of the Constitution didn't mean that everything was fine and nobody ever had problems again. A lot of Americans were still prevented from voting, including not just people of African descent, but also indigenous Americans, Asian Americans, and Latinx Americans. Interestingly, the women's suffrage movement until this point had mostly been in the North, but it began to grow in the Southern states after the Civil War, partly because of racism. If black men were good enough to vote, some people asked, why weren't white women? Some Northern women hoped to keep Southern white women on their side by excluding black women from their organizations and events. But that didn't stop black women from forming their own organizations to fight for their right to vote. One of these groups was the National Association of Colored Women, formed in 1896 and led by Mary Church Terrell, an activist, teacher, and college graduate. On the other hand, allowing women to vote wouldn't just mean white women, it would include women of color. It was assumed then that while allowing black men to vote would help one political party more than the other, if women were allowed to vote, no party would really get more of an advantage than the other. And as a result, neither political party pushed very hard for women's suffrage. Women's suffrage did expand, though, in the Western territories. Especially in frontier towns, women were often expected to work just as hard as men, so it made little sense to prevent them from voting. Wyoming legalized women's right to vote in 1869 in order to convince people to move there. The territories of Washington and Utah allowed women to vote for a few years until each became a state. By 1909, only four states allowed full suffrage for women, although more than half of the states allowed women either partial voting rights or voting for school boards. The Seneca Falls Convention was about more than just getting women the right to vote. Those women also wanted social and economic equality. But as they kept pushing for equality, the movement started to focus on voting as a tool for getting the other things they wanted. In later years, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her closest friend, Susan B. Anthony, disagreed over this. Susan was very focused on the vote as a clear goal for the movement, but Elizabeth got tired of only talking about the vote and not all the other opportunities she wanted women to have. But the two of them together are still seen as leaders of the women's rights movement in the 1800s. Partly because, along with suffragists Matilda Jocelyn Gage and Ida Husted Harper, they wrote a book called The History of Women's Suffrage in 1881. They figured that male historians wouldn't pay attention to women's history, and they wanted people to remember the work that they did, at least from their own perspectives. And this wasn't just a book. It was so big it ended up being six books, totaling 6,000 pages. At the same time that people were pushing for women's rights and for the abolition of slavery, another social movement was picking up steam. Supporters of temperance wanted people to stop drinking alcohol. Although some people still said that women shouldn't be involved in politics, there were a lot of women involved in the temperance movement. Temperance was considered a moral issue. Drinking a lot was considered bad behavior. Today, we consider alcoholism, or addiction to alcohol, a medical condition, but at the time, they thought that people who drank too much just needed to decide not to. That meant that if someone was spending all their family's money on alcohol, they weren't sick, they were just being a bad husband and father. Men and women in the temperance movement felt the solution was to outlaw alcohol entirely, and they tried to convince other people to swear off of alcohol forever. Some women wanted alcoholism to be a legal reason for divorce. Temperance was seen by a lot of people as a reasonable movement for women to be involved in because it had to do with the home. When husbands spent their family's money on alcohol, there was less food to go around. The family might get kicked out of their home, or the man might lose his job. They also talked about men who came home drunk and hurt their wives and children as a result. These things happened in all kinds of households, rich, poor, immigrant, and culturally American homes. In many immigrant communities, though, saloons were community centers and places for men to gather outside of their homes, since it wasn't generally acceptable for women to gather there. 
and that meant that a lot of husbands spent time drinking with their friends because that was how they relaxed. As a result, a lot of people said that alcoholism and abuse were immigrant problems, or problems with poor communities. Since it had such a direct impact on the home, women had a justifiable stake in temperance. Women were also considered more moral than men, so people thought it was a woman's job to influence men to be better, in this case, not to drink. A lot of women in the suffrage movement got their start in the temperance movement. Susan B. Anthony is one example. She came from a very supportive home, and of the social issues that meant the most to her, she chose to push for temperance. But just like in abolition meetings where women were shouted down, told to be quiet, or not allowed to attend, women had trouble participating in the temperance movement especially because a lot of ministers were involved in temperance, and many of them used the Bible to say that women shouldn't participate in public. They did the same thing to support slavery, especially in the southern states. So Susan started to attend meetings for women's rights, and in 1851 she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The two became close friends and worked together for women's suffrage for the rest of their lives. Even though it might seem strange, not all women wanted to be able to vote. Men and women might oppose suffrage for a variety of reasons. They might argue that women weren't as knowledgeable about the ways of the world or about politics as men were, or that women were simply more fragile and shouldn't be exposed to politics, which were dirty and sometimes immoral. The idea that women couldn't cast votes independently, that they would just do what their fathers or husbands told them to, was the biggest reason that the British colonies didn't allow women to vote. And if women couldn't own property in their own right, why should they get a vote since they didn't have a material stake in the community? It was only in the middle of the 1800s that white men without property were finally allowed to vote in some states. A number of political cartoons were published to oppose women's suffrage. A lot of them were based on the idea that if women could vote, then those women would start to act more like men, and those women's husbands would be forced to stay home and do the housework. This cartoon is pretty well known. It shows a man washing laundry and a baby on the floor by his feet. On the wall is a sign that says, Everybody works but mother. She's a suffragette. The idea was that if women were able to vote, that would mean they were stepping into the realm of men, doing things that men did. And as a result, of course, men would have to do the things that women had been doing up until that point. Pretty silly, right? Oh no, a man has to wash his own clothes. It's interesting to note, too, that one of the reasons people gave to oppose the end of slavery is that if black people were free, they would then enslave white people, which is, of course, ridiculous. But for people who had only ever lived in a world where some people were more important, more special than others, it was hard for a lot of folks to imagine equality. They thought more rights for someone else meant fewer rights for me. Another reason some people opposed women voting was because they thought it would cause problems between a husband and wife, and potentially tear homes apart. Remember that divorce was pretty uncommon and hard to get. Well, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as well as a number of other women, thought that that shouldn't be the case. They pushed for easier divorces so that women could more easily protect themselves from husbands who mistreated them. This meant that a lot of people believed that suffrage didn't just mean women voting, it also meant that women could leave their husbands whenever they wanted and they thought that would ruin society. Some of the women who opposed suffrage aren't who you might think. There were a lot of housewives and women who took pride in the traditional idea of what women should do and be, but some women were professionals as well. Sarah Josepha Hale, who was the editor of the magazine Godey's Ladies Book and wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb, was opposed to suffrage. She thought women doing things that men traditionally did was undignified. What a degrading idea, she said, as though the worth of porcelain should be estimated by its resemblance to iron. Men and women should be different, was her argument, and a lot of women as well as men agreed. Some of the opposition to women's suffrage was overcome by the temperance argument. If women were supposed to be more moral than men, why not let them exert their morals through the ballot box? It was the same argument that people made for women to vote on abolitionism, but that movement was smaller than the temperance movement. And temperance didn't threaten to crush the southern economy. After the Civil War, though, when slavery was over, the temperance movement continued and became linked to women's suffrage through a woman named Frances Willard. Companies that produced beer and liquor started to worry that women might get the vote and then outlaw their industry, so they started working against suffrage. Alcohol producers insisted that their employees vote against suffrage, and they paid politicians to vote against it. In the end, alcohol was outlawed in the 18th Amendment more than a year before women were allowed to vote in federal elections, which is a great example of how people can have an impact on government even if they can't vote. 
People who aren't old enough to vote yet change the world every day by acting in other ways. It's important to remember, too, that while a lot of people had opinions about whether women should be able to vote or not, there were also plenty of people who didn't have a strong opinion either way, or who just didn't really talk publicly about those opinions. Juliette Gordon Lowe, who you know as the founder of the Girl Scouts, was never very public about her opinions on women's suffrage. She did draw this doodle, which shows a suffragist, probably herself, sneaking up on a member of Congress. Underneath, it says, if other things fail, put salt on his tail, which doesn't really make sense on its own, but it's a line from the nursery rhyme Simple Simon. Some people think that if she meant for the suffragist in her doodle to be her, maybe she did support votes for women, but we know that her mother was opposed to suffrage, so maybe Juliet was one of those women who understood both sides and felt a little conflicted about it. Either way, she didn't want the Girl Scouts to alienate anyone or for people to confuse her opinions with the official stance of the Scouts. She wanted all girls to be welcome and didn't want her personal political ideas to discourage any parents from allowing their daughters to be Girl Scouts. Although Elizabeth Cady Stanton helped to start and to lead the women's suffrage movement, she recognized by her later years that she wouldn't live to see the end of the fight. Instead, a new generation of women came into the movement at the end of the 1800s. It was a new time in America, and these women pushed for their rights a little differently than the previous generation had. Rather than holding meetings and sending petitions, women's suffrage organizations focused on parades, marches, and protests. In the early 1900s, some women in England started using more militant tactics to fight for their right to vote. Emmeline Pankhurst was known for supporting violent tactics like breaking windows and setting things on fire. When these women were arrested, many of them engaged in hunger strikes in jail. They refused to eat. At first, officials released these women rather than letting them starve to death, but later they began force-feeding them to keep them alive. Although the destructive tactics didn't appear in the movement in the United States, Alice Paul participated in protests with Emmeline's organization in England before bringing some of those ideas back to the U.S. to lead the suffrage movement in her home country. In January 1917, Alice's organization, called the National Woman's Party, started the Silent Sentinel protests to draw attention to their cause. Six days a week, women stood silently on the sidewalk outside the White House to protest President Wilson's inaction on behalf of women. By that summer, the protesters started getting arrested on charges like obstructing traffic. By the fall, women were still being arrested and jailed for longer and longer terms. Some of these women, led by Alice, tried to go on hunger strikes and were force-fed by guards. In November, a number of those women were beaten and tortured by guards in what came to be called the Night of Terror. The women were released after that, but they kept protesting for more than another year, and police kept arresting them. Their protests brought attention to their cause, and the National Woman's Party encouraged people to elect pro-suffrage representatives to Congress. In 1919, Congress approved a women's suffrage amendment. It took just over a year for 36 states to approve the amendment, and on August 26, 1920, women's suffrage was finally federally mandated. Sort of. The 19th Amendment says that the right to vote can't be denied on the basis of sex. But that isn't the same thing as saying that every woman has to be allowed to vote. Black women were often denied the right to vote in the same way that black men were, with state-enforced poll taxes or literacy tests, and through violence and threats. Many of the same tactics were used to keep Native or Indigenous Americans from voting as well. It wasn't until 1962 that the last state made it illegal to deny people the right to vote due to their Native status. It wasn't until 1964 that the 24th Amendment to the Constitution declared poll taxes, basically requiring someone to pay in order to vote, unconstitutional. Meanwhile, immigrants from China weren't allowed to become American citizens until 1943, and because they weren't citizens, they weren't able to vote. In 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act that declared that no one could be denied their right to vote because of their race. In 1975, they added to that act to make ballots available in other languages so that Americans who don't speak English fluently won't be prevented from voting. Even as recently as 2013, the Supreme Court has ruled on how exactly the Voting Rights Act will work. So even though voting rights might feel like something that was settled a long time ago, remember that a lot of things have changed since your parents or grandparents were born. And we're still discussing as a nation who gets an official voice in our government. And... I know, some of you might not really care much about history. It's history, after all, it's already happened. Why does it matter? Well, have you ever been stung by a bee? 
or even seen a friend stung? It hurt, didn't it? And maybe now you're kind of afraid to be around bees because you don't want to get stung again? Well, the same way that we as individuals can be shaped by our experiences, we as a country are shaped by our past. Every group of people has brought something to the table and changed our story just a little, like a new ingredient in a really tasty stew. And maybe we put the potatoes in there so long ago that we can't even remember what exactly that flavor is anymore, but that doesn't mean it goes away. We have to remember those potatoes, part of our history, in order to understand that stew so we can understand who we are today. And if we don't understand who we are right now, we cannot begin the work to make ourselves better. The United States was formed by imperfect people in the hope that even though they couldn't figure out how to achieve all the ideals they wrote in the founding documents, future generations would always be working to get us closer to those ideals. I've been talking a lot about voting rights, and voting is incredibly important, but it's not the only way to participate in government. Just like the women of the suffrage movement, even if you can't vote, you can still participate in the national conversation. So ask questions. Ask your family and friends what they think. Ask them why they think that way and ask yourself the same questions. It's okay to disagree with people and talking through it can help everybody understand each other better. Explore your community. Find out what problems people are struggling with and try to brainstorm ways that you and your friends can help. Find out who your local representatives are, not only on the federal level, but at the state and local levels too. If you have a hobby you really like, see if you can find a way to use that hobby to benefit the community. Volunteer with a local organization. The Girl Scout Law says you will use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and be sister to every Girl Scout. Now that you know more about our history, you're one step closer to finding a way to do just that. And now that you know more about women's suffrage movement and how thousands of people demanded their rights to be recognized and their voices be heard, check out the activity guide for the 19th Amendment Centennial Program to see what activities you can do to earn your patch. You aren't limited to the suggestions in the book, but maybe they'll give you an idea on how you can engage with this history in a way that's important to you. Contact your local national park to see if they're participating in the program and have patches. And if they aren't, have your troop or unit leader mail or email your completion certificate to us at Women's Rights National Historical Park, and we'll send you your patch. Thanks for watching, and good luck.